Okay, so today we're talking about the cartoon non-debate. You know, the whole serious and serialized thing, the conversation that never ends. I know you're probably sick of it, but this is like with redemption arcs where I keep bringing it up in other videos and I need to just do a video entirely about it on its own for once and stop playing just the tip with my own opinions. Part of why this conversation is so cyclical and difficult to drill into people's heads is that fandom likes to think in absolutes. Fandom can't say something like, I like following a long-term story more than I like getting a dozen little stories. They have to say some kind of garbage like, like, serialized shows are inherently better than episodic shows, which is a phrase that is as frequently repeated as it is laughably stupid. I need to get this part out right now. If you have ever said this sentence out loud or in a social media post, you are a dumb fucking sad sack. So when someone comes out criticizing the glut of bad serialized cartoons that bungle their plots in the name of chasing a trend, that gets filtered into the fandom brain as saying, serialization is inherently bad and nobody should do it. I know that doesn't make sense to those of you with working brains, but remember, some people are sending death threats over review scores for Zelda. We're not really dealing with a sane, stable group of people here. Whenever you're trying to sort out the reasons behind completely irrational behavior, their irrational is usually the quickest and most correct answer. And if you're wondering if this fandom brain mentality means there's a vicious cycle of quibbling over subjectivity, you're right. Fandom sure does love to change the subject when the topic of the conversation gets inconvenient. This is how fandom handles everything, by the way. This is why when I criticize snapshot redemptions, some drooling simpleton will show up going, it works if it's done well, which is a useless non-argument that shows you weren't paying attention in the first place. As someone who likes to foster discussion about why frequently mishandled tropes often fail to stick the landing, this adamant refusal to engage with the discussion and just spout scripture like a Catholic in a symposium on antimatter is increasingly wearing on my patience. It's the most difficult part about this job because fandom gets so attached to tropes or concepts that if you even try to discuss them in any objective way, they just shut their ears and start repeating, it works if it's done well, it works if it's done well, it works if it's done well, over and over again like the start of a spree killer's manifesto. Just recently I was discussing Magic Systems, a fake storytelling concept invented by fandom over on my Tumblr, and the discussion was routinely being ground to a halt by people who kept repeating, it works if it's done well, it works if it's done well, it works if it's done well. To the point I just dropped any pretense of professionalism and started asking them if they were diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome. All of this is to say right up front that I expect you to pay close attention to what I'm saying in this video. Especially close attention. If at any point you feel compelled to say it works if it's done well, or any similar phrase, that's a sign you're not paying attention, your comments will be deleted, and you will be permanently hidden. I'm not kidding. I am so tired of this thought terminating cliche. If you don't want to think critically, then that's fine. But leave. Now, so one argument I often see with alarming frequency is that serialized cartoons are more mature than episodic cartoons and don't treat the audience like idiots. Now, that has never been true. There have been some really dumb serialized cartoons out there that do think you're stupid, but it's more laughable in a time where Bluey is making grown-ass adults cry with its surprisingly profound moments. It says, flowers may bloom again, but a person never has a chance to be young again. What does that mean? It means it's shower time. For real life. For real life. <laughs> but we all know by now that fandom's obsession with maturity is not about intellectual maturity or even just speaking plainly about the world, it's about the superficial trappings of maturity. See, there are two ways to be mature. You could talk about heavy subject matter in a frank way, confront things that represent collective fears, or even address political subject matter. Cartoons do this all the time, they're always confronting heavy subjects. Hell, Pixar did an entire film about depression and even suddenly confronted the uncomfortable truth that many don't like to accept that depression often happens because of things beyond your control. Riley's mind starts to quite literally shut down and it takes the emotions themselves to fix things. And it does it by confronting the fact that sadness and negativity are not things to be feared. This is something many adults don't like to accept. Or for those of you who sneer and stamp your feet when Pixar is mentioned positively post Lightyear, how about the works of Isao Takahata, who has never really been afraid to cover subjects like the deadly consequences of pride, the deadly consequences of urbanism, and how much he fucking hates systemic misogyny. Admittedly, none of his films are easy to watch. They're either very sad really wrap you up in the drudgery of life in the 60s, or whack you in the face with a raccoon's hairy nutsack. Okay, are you making some of those up? Nope, they're all real. Probably worth the Google. The second kind of maturity is... Cock shot! Ten, no, five, eight, shit, five. Now, both of these 
these things are fine, there have been stories that incorporate both of those things. Most science fiction pre-Star Wars was like this, often deeply political. Hell, Robocop is one of the goriest films most kids have seen. It's also one of the most deeply anti-capitalist. But being the first one is hard, and as was shown, also very kid-friendly. I've long said that the mature animation animation nerds want already exist in most Pixar films and like half of Studio Ghibli's work, but because those films tend to be cutesy and friendly, they turn their nose up at it. A Pixar film asking you to stop wasting your life and stop letting it pass by you and enjoy the simpler things by seeing a newborn experience life for the first time, eh. That sounds like it's for babies. Now a DreamWorks film asking you to stop wasting your life and stop letting it pass by you and enjoy the simpler things by seeing a cat fight little Timmy's first OC with lots of overly long fight scenes, now that's a real fucking movie. This is partially why fandom is so enamored with villains and really doesn't like stories that don't have them. Because the villains and the fight scenes are what they associate with maturity, despite the fact that both of those things are pretty childish. And when you point those things out, they move the goalposts. I brought it up before, but there's an ocean of people posting compilations of Avatar clips where they fight and people die and Katara rings out her hair and go, This is a kid's show? Disney, are you okay? Despite the fact that literally nobody in the world has ever suggested these things are not appropriate for children. Children learn about death at the age of five, and I doubt most parents really thought much of a 14-year-old girl rinsing out her hair. This obsession with making animation seem more mature than it is confused me for a long time, but I've come to grips with reality that a lot of people think they're being made fun of for watching cartoons, and while there are weirdos on Twitter making that argument, I've always never taken much stock into it. But I feel like there's a harsh truth that a lot of animation fandom needs to hear. It isn't watching Bluey that makes people think you're an emotionally stunted man-child who refuses to grow up. It's watching Attack on Titan that does that. It's watching Steven Universe and making very sincere arguments that it's a very profound show for adults that does that. It's when you're asked what your favorite Magical Girl show is and you say the one where little girls get brutally tortured that does that. These things have always, and I do mean always, been a child badly applying mommy's makeup and wearing high heels that are way too big so they can be a real grown up. It's like Manhunt, you know that Rockstar game from 20 years ago about being in a snuff film? It's rated M, which means 12 year olds aren't supposed to be playing it, but nobody outside of 12 year olds was actually going to want to play it. This is why every 13 year old boy when I was a kid was all over the Grand Theft Auto games, and why it was equally fucking cringeworthy when as adults they tried to claim Grand Theft Auto 5 as one of the greatest games of all time. Billy, you were supposed to have grown out of Grand Theft Auto 7 years ago. The perception of childishness isn't watching Little Bear, because everyone likes Little Bear. Grown ass adults will sit down and watch an episode of Little Bear. When my nephew was very little, he was really into Paw Patrol, and my mother would watch it with him all the time. And now it's Pokemon. Most of this stuff is keyed as all ages for a reason. Everyone can enjoy it. But the superficially mature is something that only young teenagers enjoy. And that's fine, most people grow out of their that's for babies phase, but even when they do, they probably still find a certain childish glee in splatter movies. Most people have a diverse media diet, most people can watch soap operas and Bluey, but animation nerds will only watch one kind of show because they're trying to prove a point that nobody but them cares about. I mentioned before there's an issue of dogma, where a lot of people believe that serialized, story-driven shows are inherently better in every way. Now, the general public doesn't believe this. They watch both and don't have an identity crisis about it, and good writers generally view these methods of storytelling as tools to use when they need them. John Favreau once said that The Mandalorian had no ending planned and there wasn't a finale they were building to because it is a television show. And that's especially apparent when you compare it to the other Star Wars series that are serialized, because they're much shorter. And this is why serialized cartoons are so terrible, because this kind of mindset is held only by idiots who don't know what they're doing or what they're talking about, so shitty writers gravitate towards serialization like a galaxy around a black hole. Good writers go, well, the show I'm making now would be better if it was episodic, maybe next time I'll make a serialized show. While bad writers go, it has to be serialized to be taken seriously, just like my favorite adventure fantasy that nobody but me likes. In animation, it was always unpopular because no studio could ever guarantee the audience will see all of them because the likelihood that dad will change the channel over to the hockey game and ignore your cries of, hey, I was watching that was always statistically high. While streaming is often perceived to be very friendly to serialized shows, the business model of streaming is even more hostile to it than ever before 
because there's more money in making 20 single season shows than there is in making five three season shows, and so far nobody other than Disney has thought to revive the concept of a miniseries. Despite animation fandom loving story driven shows, the Owl House's story ended and yet people still want it to come back, do spin offs, comics, other shit. There's a ton of people who desperately want a story about Caleb and Evelyn, and acting as if they have some kind of unseen potential, despite the fact that they don't actually matter. They say story driven shows are better because it's what they think other people want to hear, but they still want to wring every last ounce of content out of it because they just want more and more 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 more. I could sit here and point out that the Owl House's slip into series realization is exactly the reason they didn't cover whatever pointless diversion you wanted them to, and how a more open and episodic approach to storytelling would have left room for those fun divergences. But I already know you're not listening. You're probably in the comments writing seven paragraphs about how one obscure anime from 2009 proves me completely wrong, or about how that remark proves I'm secretly a white supremacist somehow. See, people already take animation seriously. If they didn't, cartoons talking about periods wouldn't make the fucking news with rounds of applause, and 12 Forever wouldn't have immediately cocked everyone's ear in that its fixation on bodies and being full grown was kind of suspect. Animated films have their own category at the Oscars and have been nominated for Best Picture in the past, but when you point that out, out come the excuses. Oh, they only made that category to keep them out of Best Picture. But two films were nominated for Best Picture after it was introduced. Well, those don't count. They only give them to Disney films. The first winner was Shrek. Well, they'd never give it to a film that wasn't Western. The second winner was Spirited Away. And nowadays, they just give them to the latest Disney movie. The most recent winner was a dark fantasy drama. I'm not joking, I've had this actual conversation with people in the past and it's almost like they're trying to talk around their real issue. That when people decide to sit down and take animation seriously, it's not the kind of animation that they like and they want taken seriously. I mentioned that the most recent winner of Best Animated Feature was Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, a movie that, like most of del Toro's work, is certainly interesting to write about. Maybe I will one day. It certainly deserved the award, but the funny thing is that despite being the first animated drama to win for over a decade, the actual discussion about animated films was dominated by this weird petty fight between Turning Red and Puss in Boots' The Last Wish. Largely because The Last Wish is a by-the-numbers adventure fantasy that stole its aesthetic from Kingdom Hearts and its theme from Soul, but it had a red-eyed edgelord furry as the bad guy, so clearly it's the savior of animation forever from those evil chick flicks. And that's the real central issue, because what they're actually mad about is that an animation studio made a few girl movies. This might sound weird coming from the mature story-based animation crowd, but I've been aware of this disconnect for years. Mature animation simps will often point to Studio Ghibli as the gold standard for adult animation, but I always ask them what their favorite Ghibli film is when they do that, because nine times out of ten they'll say Princess Mononoke. A pretty standard kids action adventure film that follows Miyazaki's usual environmental themes. It's Nausicaa, but with face paint. Hell, its release in the West has called it the Star Wars of animated features. But if it was mature animation you were looking for, you would think your favorite would be Grave of the Fireflies or Only Yesterday. Films that are actually about something a little more concrete than, wow, I sure love the forest. But Mononoke is an action adventure epic, while the others are a lot slower and quieter, and in the case of Grave of the Fireflies, heart-rendingly sad. Mononoke is the genre you think of when someone says a story is anime-esque, and you can look at the story-based cartoons that get the nerds all aflutter and see many of the same things. Epic fantasy, menacing villains, big climactic fight scenes, trauma for trauma's sake, a vague and distant theme that doesn't ask you to think about anything in the here and now. It reminds me of the kind of people who really like Lord of the Rings, but only during the big fantasy battles, and don't like the quieter parts where people are talking and sharing sentiments about home and family and peace and getting really melancholy about war. I mentioned in a previous video that a lot of these shows with aspirations of being these big serious epics don't actually have any ideas to work with beyond being serious, and so their stories are actually extremely shallow. Most of them are just coming of age stories, which as a genre is deliberately vague, but the first requirement of being serious is being about something. Most of those Ghibli films everybody likes are about something. Princess Mononoke is an environmentalist film. Nausicaa, the older and better version of Mononoke, is an environmentalist film. And they're both rather honest environmentalist films, as their main central themes are mistreat nature at your own peril, puny mortal. They're about how if you don't take care of the planet, it will kill you. Your death is inevitable. The giant warrior died. That's the way it should be. The anger of the Ohm reflects the anger of the Earth. The Earth knows it's wrong for us to survive. 
If we have to depend on a monster like that. Hell, Takahata's movies are always about something very specific, like how pride can be deadly, or feminism, or the burning hatred he feels toward the stifling culture of urbanism, or how you should totally beat cops to death with your hairy ball sack. If you tried to find a central theme in any of the cartoons that are wearing the skin of these movies, you wouldn't find much. Except maybe Steven Universe? There's a lot to unpack there, it can be quite fun to see how deep the rabbit hole goes, but that's not really a story being about something, that's just a creator taking acid and reading slavery porn. They're all trying to be like other shows, except for the fact where they had something interesting to talk about. And that's why they're never going to succeed in their aspirations to be taken seriously, because they don't have anything to take seriously. They're doing this strange pantomime where they don't really know what they want to be. This is why we call a lot of them wanime, because they want to be like an anime, but their ideas stopped there. Ironically, this point is emphasized by a work that actually succeeds at this, Turning Red. Turning Red Red, the Pixar film that broke the minds of cartoon fandom, often claimed Studio Ghibli as an inspiration. And indeed, when you look at that, you probably thought of the art direction of Miyazaki's films. But the story carries a lot of elements of Takahata's work, largely because it's about more grounded issues and it honestly feels like only yesterday, but set in the 2000s against the backdrop of the boy band craze. It's not one-to-one, -one because the themes of the story are personal to the director, but that's kind of the point. It may take inspiration, but it's still something unique to that director, Domi Shi. And that's the kicker here, unique to that director. For a lot of the things we're fans of, we're not inclined to think about the creators themselves. We think about companies. Ghibli films are called Ghibli films in spite of the fact that all the classics are the ones made by two guys, and the films they made directed by other people are usually flops. We think about Disney films as just that, Disney films, in spite of the fact that most of the Disney films you remember fondly, for better or worse, are directed by two guys, John Musker and Ron Clements. The Disney films that were more notorious for being rather messy narrative-wise, like Frozen, Frozen 2, the Wreck-It Ralph films, and Ryan the Last Dragon are all either directed or executively produced by Jennifer Lee, and that's why those groups of films carry very similar ideas and tropes between them. And those things are not always well understood by the audience. I'm gonna reach out of animation a little bit to bring up Last Man Standing, a conservative sitcom made by Tim Allen. Allen once compared his character on the show to Archie Bunker, claiming that Archie Bunker was a primary inspiration. Now, Archie Bunker of All in the Family is a rather bigoted meathead. He's old-fashioned conservative even by 19 1970s standards. But where this comparison falls flat is that Alan's work on Last Man Standing was meant to be agreed with. It was a conservative show for conservative viewers. All in the Family was a liberal show for liberal viewers. Archie's bigotry was meant to be laughed at. It's very serious. You know what I'm saying to you? I'm saying that you guys want to stick with yourselves. You mean guys ought to stay with guys? <laughs> So it was simultaneously rather aggressive at times, but not so extreme that you'd honestly think Archie was a full-on white supremacist. And that divide is shown many times in the show, especially after Mike and Gloria leave, and Archie no longer has someone to dress him down, and so he cools off and grows as a person because without the contrasting characters, that central gimmick just doesn't work. It made Archie into a character a lot of people loved because at his core is someone who means well, but was just taught a lot of garbage. Ironically, rewatching the show helped me sort out some very complicated feelings about my own father, because I see a lot of parallels between them. So to compare Tim Allen's conservative mouthpiece to a character who goes through a lot of personal growth is quite frankly fucking nonsense. A similar thing happened when Trey Parker and Matt Stone claimed Archie Bunker as an inspiration for Eric Cartman of all people. Cartman, a kid who once tried to lead a Nazi uprising compared to Archie Bunker who looked the Klan right in the eye and threatened to beat the shit out of them if they ever showed up in his neighborhood. And if we catch you guys, Point any crosses, we're gonna come up here and we're gonna bust your honky hindies. <laughs> That's the problem with claiming something as an inspiration, because I've seen people claim inspiration and got the thing they were inspired by completely fucking wrong. This is one of those subjects I keep banging my head against because I know for a fact that people who need to hear this just flat out won't. They won't listen. If anything, they're probably gonna decry most of those stories that are about things as preachy or just continue to miss the point. As I'm writing this, I'm watching my good buddy Ginger trying to tell some guy that making a serious story about existential dread is completely undercut by the fact that they're clinging to the the anime trope of a 1,000 year old child, and that guy just continues talking past her despite the fact that they came to him looking for advice on how to make the story work. And this guy is just going on and on and on about his complex lore, and it's like, dude, just make the 
character a fucking adult, you stubborn asshole. And Ginger is much smarter than I am and they're still talking to a brick wall. I don't know how to make this any clearer than I've already made it because the real problem is you have 30 somethings who want to keep watching Toonami and they don't want the normies to roll their eyes at them for it and screaming xenophobe hasn't worked so they're officially out of ideas. That's what all this is. That's what it's always been. Fuck, I'm tired. I hope that Pokemon video does well and I can pivot my contact to something else.